Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Noel Smith. Noel, are you ready to join the mission? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> let me introduce you to the audience. Noel is the Chief Investment Officer of Convex Asset Management and Head of Options Trading at Tanius Technology and most important thing is that Noel is versed in high frequency trading, relevant market structure, and the underlying uh, technology. He's been in the business of managing risk for over 25 years. Maybe you could just start off by telling us what is the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world? I think one of the things that is more unique about what we would talk about is that my background is proprietary trading and market making. And most of the people that actually work in the sausage factory of the marketplace aren't usually people that are speaking publicly, writing publicly or whatever else. You either get you know, the eggheads that do white papers or you have the people that are slaving away in some office tower in Chicago or New York, uh, which was basically what I used to do. And they have no incentive whatsoever to be public. Frankly, it's probably the opposite. The more public you are, the more you might talk about uh, things that you can give away to your competition. So most people with my background don't ever talk publicly. So there's a little bit of uniqueness in that regard. Mm. And for the people that don't understand it at all, thinking about my mother listening and, you know, she's like market making. Okay. Sounds interesting, but could you simply describe what you did as a market maker? What is, what does it mean to be a market maker? Sure. So when you look for a quote in something like Apple or say Apple options, there is a number on your screen and say the Apple price is $150 bid at $151 offered. Somebody has to come up with that number. And that number is created by people like me. They say, I will pay $150 for, you know, 500 shares of Apple or conversely, I will pay, you know, $1.50 for 50 Apple options or a hundred Apple options. And then I will pay, you know, a dollar for a thousand Apple options, et cetera. There is a band around, but the, what I mean by a market maker is the guy that actually makes the market, the person that produces the price that you can interact with. And if you think about that, you know, most people would think about a market as well. I thought there's just a buyer and a seller and they come together. Why do you need a market maker? Same reason if you were to buy or sell a car, you probably don't always go to the individual that wants to buy your car. You might end up going to a dealer. And the reason you'd go to a dealer is because of liquidity and time and ease. So say you have a $50,000 car that you think is worth $50,000, but the dealer gives you, you know, 48,500 for it. You know that you're losing 1500 bucks, but you're in and out in 10 minutes and it's a piece of cake and you've got rid of your car. And now you can get a new car for $55,000 with that same dealer or sell to you for that spread on both sides. That's basically what it is. I mean, it doesn't really matter what the thing is. You're making a market, whether it be BMWs or Apple stock. And if, if we go back in time, let's go back a couple hundred years when the U.S. You know, stock market started. And then as it developed, um, we had you know, counters. And at those counters were market makers in particular stocks or dealers and, and all that. What's the history of market making? Is that, is that would it be the case to say that um, the history of market maker was that you know, in the stock exchange, there would be certain places where different people would be making a market in a particular group of stocks or individual stocks. Is that how it started? So how it really started is not like that. Okay. Um, so the, the, the Dutch started trading stocks with the, the Dutch East India company in 1650s or whatever, but in the United States, it went to wall street a little bit, but the real markets that most people don't really understand that gird a lot of this are out of Chicago. And those markets came out of the grain markets. So if you are a Midwestern farmer making, you know, growing corn and you weren't really sure about your crops. So you would go to a futures exchange, the Chicago board of trade, and you would sell or buy a futures contract, depending on what you thought your, your harvest was going to be for that year. So the derivatives market in Chicago is really rooted in commodities. 
specifically grains. And then as that matured, it got into uh, pork bellies and hogs and, you know, beans, et cetera. And that matured into other instruments like euro dollars, bonds, and then options. And most underlying stocks used to trade in New York. And then the derivatives of those instruments would trade out of Chicago. So I think you'll find that if you talk to people like me that are market making in the options space, Pretty much a lot of us come out of Chicago. I'm born and bred out of Chicago, so I'm happy. I happen to be born into it, but uh, it's very common to have options guys and futures guys come out of Chicago. And maybe uh, for the for the listeners, you can't see, but you've got all these computer screens behind you, and you know, showing lots of charts and graphs and things like that. Maybe you could just explain, you know, what your investment style or strategy is at Convex Asset Management, so people understand, like, how are you trading. Uh, versus another, maybe that will also help them understand the story when we get to it. So as, as a market maker, you know, say for instance, I'll stick with the car analogy because it's something I think anybody can understand. So if you are a, um, a BMW buyer and seller, you're a dealer, okay? And somebody comes to you and says, I want to sell a, a BMW. You say, okay, I think it's worth $50,000. I'll pay you 49. You say, okay, fine. I'll buy one, one BMW for $49,000. And the guy comes back to you 10 minutes later and says something like, well, I've got five more to sell. And you're like, I wish you would have told me you had six all along. I'll pay you $45,000 for the next five. Then he comes back an hour later and says, I've got a thousand more to sell. And you're like, well, this is a totally different situation and I'll pay $20,000. And at some point as a dealer, the, the light goes off in your head. This guy is doing something for a larger reason. And you, when you go from being a pit trader like I was to being a proprietary trader, which is trading with your own money, then you start to realize what the other side is doing more and more. And then what you really, the aha moment for me was you have this total disconnect between the market making and proprietary trading community and the hedge fund community. The hedge fund community is uh, basically a, a marketing campaign. And then you have the proprietary trading community, which is the opposite of that. There is no marketing. The only function for a proprietary trading firm is to make money. They don't care at all what you look like, what you sound like, or anything like that. The only function in life is to make money or lose less. Same, same. Mm -hmm. And um, so what, I'm, what I've tried to do is bridge that gap. And that's a long way to answer to your question, which is, so what are we doing? We are trying to bridge that gap. We're trying to bring some of the ideas and uniqueness out of the, the secretive parts of the Chicago and New York trading community that other investors don't really ever see. You know, there's a million long short hedge funds out there. Yeah, we're going to go long Tesla and short ExxonMobil. Okay, fine. Um, but nobody gets to see the kind of strategies that are being run at like Citadel, Susquehanna, Optiver, Jump, et cetera. You know, these are the firms that I came, I came out of. And that is the trading that we try to bring to our investors. And so what you're saying, if, if I understand it correctly, it's what you're saying is that you're kind of... Uh, as a market maker, you're in the middle and you're able to understand the flows better than let's say a hedge fund would, you know, they just think, okay, I want to buy this. And then they put in an order for it. Whereas you're seeing uh, the, the example you used about the uh, car is basically starting to, as, as, as you started to, as the seller started to reveal that they had more inventory than you thought, things start changing in the way that you start pricing and thinking about things. And so uh, for investors in your fund, basically they're able to, to get you in the middle, getting a feel for what that is and then taking uh, a position in relation to that, or maybe explain it a little bit more. Sure. So I don't know how much detail you'd like me to go into, but we have basically four trading things that we do. Um, in no particular order, I'll just kind of go yeah. through them. We trade volatility. Basically what we're trying to do is collect money when there's nothing going on. So what we're trying to do is there is this uh, declination in price over time in volatility if nothing happens. So if, uh, if you have car insurance and you don't crash, you keep paying premiums and then you never crash. And then the insurance company collects your premium and then they never pay you anything. It's just a waste of money for you. And the dream on your end is that if you do crash, it's not financially punishing for you. So what we try to do is collect some of that premium from the marketplace. And we do that in various different ways and we spread it off in other, other different ways. So that is a way to make money if nothing happens. So if you know, we put on a position and we fast forward a month and everything is exactly the same, we would expect a positive p &L if nothing has changed. Uh, I, I can talk about that for three hours, but I'll keep it short. The, the next trade is uh, more of a, a bond relative value arbitrate within the futures options. So we're not trading bonds, 
We're not trading bond futures, but we're trading bond futures options. And what we're doing is we're looking at a curve on the surface of this options surface. And we're looking at what we think events will make the market move versus what the marketplace is implying. So if there is a CPI number like there was earlier today or a PPI number tomorrow, and we the bond market is pricing in a, a 10 tick move for the bonds, and we think it's worth 12, well, we think 10 is too cheap and we're going to buy that. And we hope to make two to four ticks or something like that. So that's what we do in the bond trade. Our next trade is a dispersion trade. What we do with the dispersion trade is we're typically selling volatility in the S&P 500 index. And then we're simultaneously buying the constituents of that same S&P 500 index so that there is a netting effect between the volatility between what is expected in the index versus the components of that same index. It can get really wonky and there's a lot of ways to describe that. But again, I'll keep it short. And our fourth main trade is just volatility um, volatility arbit arbitrage. So what we're doing is we're buying volatility in say Exxon and we're selling volatility in say Chevron. And we hope that they both go the way we want them to. We make money on both sides. So that the, is a very, very condensed uh, version of what well, we're doing. Well explained. And for the futures options you talked about for bonds, uh, ultimately you're trading the same thing that a bond investor would be trading, which is what's your expectation of interest rates or what does the CPI tell us about the way the market's perceiving that, and then you come up with a thesis, and then you're you're betting on that thesis, but you're doing it through a different type of instrument than a typical, let's say, bond fund guy would do it. Is that correct? And if so, what do you get from that instrument that that let's say a typical bond investor wouldn't get? So your assumptions are very reasonable, but unfortunately incorrect. Yep. So a bond a That's bond why investor. I got you on the call. So a bond investor is going to look at, you know, what Powell is saying and where do we think interest rates are going to be? So they're going to look at a CPI and say, okay, CPI is coming in in line. So we think that, you know, uh, rates are going to top out at 5% in May. And then they're going to, you know, the, the Fed fund futures or the Euro dollar market is saying that we're going to go down through the end of 2023 and 2024. And so there's this kind of shape of the curve. Um, that is relevant to me, but I'm more interested in the instantaneous move of a CPI or a non-farm payroll number or whatever else, because the market price of that straddle, in other words, the simultaneous purchase and say, uh, purchase of a call and purchase of a put has some kind of distribution around it. And what we're basically saying is that distribution is either too wide or too narrow. And we take a, an opinion around that. So we're not saying that I think that Paul was wearing glasses today. Therefore he has a slightly different vibe in his whatever and we're trying to you know come up with some kind of voodoo as to why we think that rates are going to go up a quarter point or down a quarter point or up a quarter point of, of 30 days hence uh, i have no idea any more than anybody else on that stuff but we do have an opinion on say non-farm payrolls because we have dozens and dozens or hundreds of, of data points saying that non-farm payrolls with these conditions will typically move the bonds 25 ticks Okay, and then and if they're priced at thirty five ticks, well, then we can make some, we can make a trade there. So what we're doing is we're using specific math to make a judgment as opposed to something that is more nebulous, like uh, what words did Powell not use or did Yellen use in contrast to Powell three seconds later in some other different speech. That stuff to me is too amorphous and too difficult to price. So mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're using specific math to come up with a judgment, and that judgment is an extrapolation. We're we're looking at past data like everybody else, and we're coming up with a present value, and then we're, we're, we're forwarding that value. We're coming up with something that we think is correct. And just uh, my last question, just because I find it fascinating, it's not an area I know a lot about, but um, in your space, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of, as you say, high frequency trading. Uh, does that mean that you do not have longer term themes or views, or do you also have longer term themes or views about things uh, just curious, like how does how does your thinking you know line up? So I'm not currently high frequency trading. It is a different business. Yep. Um, I have a background in it and I have association with it, but it's not my core business right now. So I have the same opinion as everybody else. I'm like say Tesla cars. They're cool cars. They're they're fast and all this other stuff. But the Tesla stock, I have no idea if it's worth 192 or 182 or 202. I have no opinion on that. Uh, if anything, I think it's probably worth more like 92, you know, not 192. I mean, it seems so high to me, right. but, but here we are. Um, we look at 
usually running uh, snapshots of volatility. And the reason we use volatility is because we find it to be the most actionable and accurate information. And the reason it's accurate and actionable is because the smartest money in the world tip, typically goes into the volatility markets because they get so much leverage. And if they're correct, they can be very handsomely paid. So the information that you can glean from that, we find to be more useful and more uh, when we're more able to pinpoint it as opposed to, again, what is Powell doing? What kind of a hat is Powell wearing? Um, and th therefore, we kind of we tried to divine some information from Dev Powell's hat. That to me is just, uh, it's, I'm being silly, but it's not that far from what CNBC does, right? They, they come up with some kind of weird narrative about the marketplace and something else that I just find to be irrational. So what we're really doing is almost all of our judgment is math-based. There is some discretion, but is, it is a minority of our judgment. When I was uh, when I started as an analyst, it was 1993 here in Thailand, and that basically meant we were just leaving the chalkboard era, where people were putting up quotes on the chalkboards, and we were into the digital era, where and but what was funny was that you know I worked at different you know brokers, and most of their volume was local traders, and they would come into the um, to the to the brokerage, and they'd sit down in front of these boards with all of these uh, LED lights. And what was kind of surprising to me was there's a lot of grandmas and grandpas that came with their lunch bales and they came and they traded and they all knew each other and they had a lot of fun and they traded and they watched each other's trades and they talked. But they saw those, uh, those uh, flashing uh, digital lights, LEDs, as like them trading against their friend in the room in some ways. And I always used to try to tell my students as well as the clients like, there's something going on behind that with millions of people. And then there's people that are really experts in that company. But then there's people behind those people who are betting on the behavior, not of the stock, but of the other people's reaction to that behavior. And then there's people behind those people who are trying to understand and, and profit from the behavior of that second group of people's interpretation of the first group of people's interpretation of, you know, and I, I think when I think about what you're talking about, a lot of what what you're doing, it sounds like is, is, is basically understanding the behaviors of the markets and figuring out how do you profit from it with that? Am I, am I wrong again in, in my explanation? Or <laughs> let me know. No, I feel like I've been uh, too critical. No, no. you're not wrong. Um, it is. There are several different levels of information you can focus on, uh, any one of which can be correct. We focus on volatility simply because we feel like that's where the most action is. Um, you know, coming up with a discounted cash flow model on Tesla, that's a fine business. Um, but I would never have bought Tesla stock based on any of that training. However, I can buy Tesla options all day and participate in the madness of Tesla going from, you know, zero to a zillion. Um, and, you know, my, my, one of my first, uh, you know, forays in that was the the tech bubble, right? You know, I was standing on the floor and I saw that everyone, it, 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 people assumed that nobody knew the tech bubble was a bubble. That's nonsense. Everybody knew. Everyone knew these companies had no profitability. It's two guys in a closet with a stock, with a sock puppet. Everyone knew that was not sustainable. But, you know, for every guy that was so smart and not making a trade, the guy standing right next to him was making $10 million a day, you know, trading these crazy things. And eventually the guy who's not making any money because he's too smart to make money starts doing it too. And, and that's how top. bubbles, right, exactly. That's exactly right. And that's, that's where the people who don't have good risk, you know, risk tolerances in, mm. that's how they get wiped out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to explain. It's an area that I, I don't know that much about, and I know you've given the uh, listeners some, some really good background. One last question related to that is just for a young person that says, I want to do that, what is the best pathway to it? I guess studying math or... Uh, are there any any ideas about how to get started in in what you're doing? Yeah, if you're consuming this in real time and you want real advice, one of the one of the most underappreciated jobs where you can actually do something compared to your peers is become a meteorologist. It's one of the best, hottest things that's out there right now. If you can forecast the weather and you can program, you can basically start at roughly half a million dollars a year at three dozen firms I can think of. Um, it is one of the most profitable trades in the last few years has been net gas and energy and people that are able to forecast weather well and put that into code, they can write their own ticket.
Well, there's great advice. So now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. I don't know how to answer the question because there's so many bad trades. Uh, I've just had innumerable bad trades. The first one that comes to mind is Enron. And I don't, it's, it's probably my biggest loss ever in terms of ego, absolute dollars, being wrong for so wrong for so long. It was just, it was a disaster uh, of all kinds. So Enron was like the ninth largest market cap company. And, um, you know, it was, you know, it was a pretty, you know, I don't know what the analog today would be, but, you know, a really big company that you see trade all day, every day, um, you know, not quite Google, but something less than Google, but not by much. And um, so we had a position in Enron, we started to lose money in it. And when I say we, I really mean my partner and I, because we ran the, the company and we would sit there next to each other and dialogue over trades pretty much all day, every day. And as Enron started to, to lose money, um, the, the tricky part about Enron was the information that came in as it was going down was even more wrong. So typically what happens is when a stock goes down or something moving, uh, like bonds in 2022, bonds are going down. Everyone was short them. A lot of people made money being short bonds. The problem with Enron was that people would come in, the stock would go down 10%, and then Goldman Sachs would come in and buy like 50,000 out of the money calls. And we're like, oh, you know, do we really want to get out of this thing now when, you know, somebody's out there trying to buy, you know, a hundred million dollars worth of upside. And so we stuck with it. And then you just take, take that story and repeat it like 10 times and just at each increment. So Enron didn't just go down. It went down and ripped back up, down or ripped back up. And there's just so many head fakes and the information and the quality of the information and the size of that information was such that it basically made us write it to zero, which was a very costly mistake. And how would you summarize the lessons that you learned? Um, so this is the one, we've, my partner and I only had one trade where he and I were like kind of mad at each other. Well, we had two, Kmart, Sears, and Enron. Where I said, I know why we're doing what we're doing, but what we're doing is wrong. Maybe we should stop doing what we're doing. And his answer to that was, well, we make a lot of money doing what we're doing and I don't want to change the, the process because of new information. And that makes sense to me too. So it, 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 at, he persuaded me and we, we both wrote it to zero and we both never talked about it again. Um, that was, that, what, that's how it went. But having risk measurements in place that you know you will not break, it, it, all real traders don't don't really break their risk measurement, right? Everyone, if you're a real trader, I, I kind of pause on that because basis risk is a different type of risk that a lot of guys get blown out on. But when it comes to straight, you know, price go up, price go down, almost nobody that's a professional really gets that whooped by that. Mm -hmm. Typically, you, you know, you have some percentage that you're willing to, to lose. And then no matter how much you think it stinks, you just get out. And we didn't get out of Enron. And at some point we're like, okay, well now it's five bucks, who cares? Because you know, it would even be worse if it went from five to twenty, and then we sold it all at five. From when we wrote it from sixty or whatever it was, so that was a disaster. And you know, I I don't, I don't even know what to tell the audience as to like what you learn from that, other than what they already know, which is never be wed to your trade. To me, Enron was no different than any other stock. They're just you know three or four ticker uh, letters in a ticker symbol, and there's they're indistinguishable from each other. Mm. And maybe I'll uh, share a couple of things. I mean, the first thing is that. Uh, particularly companies that are, I, I would say, good or big, uh, they tend to go down over time. And as you said, you know, that, you know, it has a, a, a shoot up and all that. And so and then it starts to go, but it takes time for it to be to, to for it to unfold. And so I think that's a lesson, you know, it's not all and that's the hard part is trying to figure out which one is this the one that's really going down to zero. But don't expect that, you know, it's just going to be easy, it's going to be hard as it's going down, trying to figure out what to do. The second thing that's really main, you know, what I'm thinking about when you talked about like applying the system and the, the you know, like your business partner said, you know, I don't want to, you know, break the system and we're making money from it. It's such a hard thing because uh, a good, a good investor has set up a, a structure 
of how to do it. And I have a structure in my, my quantitative, my, I would call mine slow quant in the sense that, you know, we, we don't, we don't trade that often, but the main thing is that, uh, every time that I've overridden my system and my structure, I've ended up underperforming and I have learned to not second guess the structure. I've also learned that there are occasionally times that I need to break the structure. And to me, that's like the hardest part of the whole thing. How do you think about like, how rigidly do you stick with something or do you have to break it at some point? I'm just curious how you handle that. So the other trade that I didn't, you know, you asked for what is my worst trade and I gave you Enron, but my other answer, my other answer would have been much more contemporaneous to today was holding volatility downside puts in 2022. So just last year, um, we had a bunch of downside puts and our main signals told us to get out of the market in, in Delta one fashion in the beginning of January. So that was golden. That was perfect. Um, but what we did is we held long downside volatility in the S and P 500. That was a, just a tremendous drag on our P and L that was, you know, so we, you know, we, we got out of the car, wait for it to crash and it just never did. You know, and so we, we got out of our, our longs and we just waited for our long puts to pay us and the market went down and we lost money on our long puts, which is absolutely maddening. So to answer your question, we ended up exiting a lot of those trades in June simply because kind of like the Enron thing, they're just losing money. I don't know when they were going to stop losing money and I've, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. That's it. <laughs> and, and, and I'm actually glad that I did because it would have continued to lose money to today. You know, the, the, the 20% or 30% that that's, that those are too wingy, more like 12 to 17% downside in the S P 500 continues to die the options. So that is just something that we, we violated our own rules in the sense that we exited a lot of that. And I'm glad that we did, but we had it on pretty big because it worked so well during COVID. Like those, those puts really paid well. So that same structure we had on a 2022 and it never paid. Yeah. So yeah. we did both. Yeah. It's uh, fascinating. I mean, I recently, my model started to give me some indications to go into financials before uh, Silicon Valley bank. And we did put a small position on it. And in the end, I, I, I decided to override the model and exit the position because what, after what happened with Silicon Valley bank, I just felt like there's just, I just don't see the upside in it. So I, I ended up getting out of it and really getting out of that position was also just for my own comfort. I don't want to spend the next 12 months defending the position that, you know, could be under just a lot of pressure. So it's <clears throat> very real things that, that you're discussing, which is pretty exciting. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what actions, here comes the hard part, what action would you re recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? Um, what is it that you're losing and how do you fit the data? So do you, do you say that, well, I've been long volatility in the downside for 25 years and in year 25, which is 2022, um, it lost money. So does that mean all of the other data is now invalidated and this is the new regime or is this just an, an outlier and everything is the way it always has been? Or is it with the advent of zero data expiration options, things have all kind of changed as they always continuously are. Um, my answer to that is you always have to be able to see the cause and effect from a lot of different things. The major, the major difference in 2022 was interest rates moving a lot, right? And that affected really everything. Um, and then if you, if you look at the S&P 500, it would basically go down and crash up, go down, crash up, which is almost the inversion of what you typically would expect, you know, go up and crash down. Um, and why is that? And you have to see the unseen. And that's such a, such a stupid thing to say in a lot of ways. Cause I mean, you know, I can't tell you to see what you don't see, but what I started to realize is that all the people that blew out in COVID with volatility weren't there for 2022. And a lot of the portfolios that are there that people buy protection on we're being pushed to the sidelines because of interest rates. With the, with the ascension of interest rates, people were starting to de-risk. And when you don't have a car, you don't have to go out and buy car insurance. So there is less to insure. So that is one of the reasons that I kind of figured out after some losses that 
you know, when there's less things to buy volatility on or buy insurance on, the need for insurance isn't there. And so if you do, if you do have a crash, there's no payout. Mm -hmm. All right. What's a resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? Well, selfishly, our website, convexam.com is more information about, about what we do. Um, but what we do is fairly complex and, and I in no way want to sound condescending, but it, it's not something that most retail people can really just, hey, well, I like what that guy does. So I'm just going to go do what that guy does. Um, learning about options and how options affect the marketplace is much more important than you think if you don't already understand that. Because options often will drive the primary thing that you're thinking about, even though you think that options are derivative of the thing, which is true. But a lot of times the derivative will drive the thing. And that's something that I think anybody can get an education on. Great. Well, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Um, to really de- to develop my business and become, do more things like this. Let people know that, uh, you know, I understand the business that I'm in mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm new to the public part of this business because it, it was never in my best interest to be public, but I wanted to develop my business and get more people to understand why options are a useful thing and not to be afraid of them. Hmm. Great. And that's, uh, I'll have links to, to, uh, to your company's website and any other stuff in the show notes. So everybody can go check it out. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to my worst and join the free weekly become a better investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Noel, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Thank you for having me today. And hopefully everyone got something out of this. Definitely. We, I know I got a lot and I know my listeners did. We appreciate you being on. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.